tonight's teaching text is from the book of John, verse nine, or John 19, verses 38 through 42, and 20, verses eight, 1 through 8. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been, been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good evening. Happy Easter. I hope you're ready to respond to the preaching as well as you did to the singing. <laughs> Not off to a good start. <laughs> Several years ago, I went on a peacemaking, uh, peacemaking trip to the Middle East and had this beautiful opportunity um, of just walking around and seeing what God was doing over there through various communities. And one morning, uh, towards the end of the trip, I had some time on my own and I'd, I'd gotten up early. And I was just walking around the old city and I found uh, this coffee shop, got some coffee and was just sort of just wandering around and I, I started seeing signs that said the garden tomb. So I started following these signs and then eventually they led me to this place that said this is the garden tomb. And there was a gentleman walking by me and I said, excuse me, sir, do you know what this is? And this is what he said, this is where some Christians believe Jesus, their Messiah, rose from the dead. And then he just kept walking. <laughs> and I remember just being so profoundly struck by the reality. Here was this extraordinary claim. And yet somebody just made a comment on it and then walked past. Well, this morning I was getting coffee in another shop in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And my barista said, oh, what's today? And then someone in the shop said, it's Easter. And he said, oh, yeah, Easter. I forgot about that. And then he put Chance the Rapper on when the, praises, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. And he says, well, at least I have some Easter music. <laughs> and then he just kept going on about his day. Another cavalier comment, but this time in a coffee shop. What an extraordinary claim that Christians are making. This is where Christians believe Jesus, their Messiah, rose from the dead. So I want to investigate this claim a little bit more fully tonight. Now, if you were here today, I'm sure that much of what I'm going to share is what you're familiar with, or if you're not familiar with it, um, I hope tonight catches you up to speed, because this is one of the central claims of our faith. But what I really hope tonight is that you're here and you're actually not a follower of Jesus, or you're a skeptic, or somebody from works dragged you along, or maybe you grew up and you're sort of loosely Catholic, or you went to a Christian school for a year or two because of the quality of the education, but it hasn't really been a considerable force in your life. But underneath in your heart, even though you may not be able to give it language, is some sort of gnawing angst that hungers for more. Well, that's what this claim that Jesus makes is actually about. Jesus says these words, I am the resurrection and the life. This is his central claim about who he is and what he offers us. So tonight I want to cover three things. The first thing is why the resurrection is so important. Why do we have to hold on to this doctrine of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? 
Secondly, why Christians actually believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Why do we believe this? With all the modern science that we have, isn't this just some Bronze Age myth that can easily be dismissed? Why do we still stubbornly today believe in the bodily resurrection? And then lastly, the difference that the resurrection actually makes in the lives of modern New Yorkers. So this first question here, why is the resurrection important? Well, the first reason that this is important is because every single one of us will die. We will all die. We have to wrestle down when we're confronted with our mortality, what happens when you're dead? Isn't this the great mystery? We will all face it. One author says this, is death the end or is there something more? This is the ultimate question. It's been the defining issue for entire cultures from the ancient Egyptians to the present. And in truth, there's no more important question that any of us will face. It is the issue that makes every other issue trivial. If you have doubts about its significance, go to a hospital or a funeral or talk to a parent who's recently lost a child. You will discover very quickly that the apparent normalcy of everyday life is a sham. Death is the great wrecking ball that destroys everything. I've experienced both ends of this wrecking ball. I've held a two-year-old girl dying of cancer, felt it ravaging her body, listened to her cry in pain. And tonight, my wife is in hospital in Tennessee as my father-in-law hovers between life and death after having another heart attack. And he's at the end of his life. And somehow, even though he has lived a long and good life, it still feels too short. Is this all there is? Every single one of us will die. And we're fools if we don't, in our modern lives, at least give that a little bit of consideration. And so Christians believe The resurrection is important because it addresses one of our fundamental human conditions, that of our mortality. We have to face it. The second reason the Christians think that this is an important issue is because it is so central to our faith. The claims of the resurrection are so staggering and they're so comprehensive that we have to take this seriously as a part of our faith. We don't get to make up what we believe. It's a received tradition. And in this tradition, the resurrection is central. Look at what the Apostle Paul says about this. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, if, but if, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are, of all people, most to be pitied. These are the words from the Apostle Paul. He basically says our entire faith hinges on the resurrection. If Jesus didn't rise, do whatever you want. So he says there's six things from this verse that are weighty issues of the proof of the resurrection. Number one, if Christ has not been raised, then what are we doing here? Number two, Our preaching is useless. Some of you are like, I didn't say it. (laughs) Three, your faith is useless. Four, you're still in your sins. How do you get rid of the guilt, the shame, the angst? The dead are lost. They're just rotting in the ground. All their ashes in a bottle. All talk of sentimentality in other places is just a myth that we're deluding ourselves to feel better about the horrific, long, eternal nothingness. And then six, we're above all people to be pitied. It's like if all the things that life offers, if Christians are resisting any of that for some vision of the afterlife, we're missing out on this life. We are above all people to be pitied. So one other author says this, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no saving, no salvation, no forgiveness of sin, and no hope of resurrected eternal life. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus is reduced to yet another good but dead man and therefore is of no considerable help to us in this life or at its end. Plainly stated, without the resurrection of Jesus, the few billion people today who worship Jesus as God are gullible. Their hope for a resurrection life after this life is the hope of silly fools who trust in a dead man to give them life. 
Subsequently, the doctrine of Jesus' resurrection is, without question, profoundly significant and worthy of the most careful consideration and examination. So Christians believe that the resurrection is important because it's central to our faith, makes our faith what it is, and because it addresses one of the fundamental things that every human being has to wrestle with, the fact that they will die and what comes next. Well, this leads then to a logical question, and that's that. Well, why, why believe in the resurrection? Well, thank you for asking. Well, we believe in the resurrection because we believe there's compelling evidence to it. It's not like you take a silly pill and then start reading the Bible. Christians believe in the resurrection for the, because there's considerable evidence in multiple forms. Now, I just want to start before I look at this by realizing there are many modern objections, and serious scholars have spent time refuting the claims of the resurrection. There's multiple theories floating around. I want to just address some of them tonight. You've probably heard of some of these. The first one is the swoon theory. And the swoon theory says Jesus wasn't really dead. He just passed out and appeared to be dead. But three days later, he woke up and he rose again. Now, the problem with this particular theory is that it was based in a time when we didn't have as much scholarship we do uh, as we do right now about the effectiveness of a Roman crucifixion. If a Roman failed to put a prisoner to death, he was put to death. This was a serious skill that the Romans had. There's no historical account of anybody surviving an execution. But before Jesus was even executed, he was flogged with a Roman cat of nine tails. And modern scientists tell us that that had the equivalent of being shot in the back with a shotgun at close range. So before Jesus even gets to the cross, he's bearing all of this stress. He's been up for nights at a time, completely overwhelmed, such a level of stress that he's sweating drops of blood, goes to the cross, is crucified after being flogged, is 75 pounds of spices are put over him. He's wrapped up in ceremonial garbs. He, into an airtight tomb that he mysteriously days later pushes open, overcomes the Roman guards, and then seemingly has the ability to convince his friends, hey, it's me, I'm actually fine. <laughs> Regardless of how fit anybody is, if Christ had done CrossFit himself to this day, nobody, after suffering that, would have been able to pull off and convince his friends he was back from the dead. Another theory is the stolen body theory, and this is the theory that the guards um, basically fell asleep sequentially. One, two, three, out. And then as they go out, the disciples come along, these timid disciples who are hiding in fear. Teenage girls are chasing off apostles. But in a moment of courage and despair, they, they, they know where the tomb is. The soldiers fall asleep, which they would have been put to death if this had happened if, if they'd lost the custody of the body. And they ran off with it. The Jews spread this theory. But part of the problem with this is that their faith was preached in the same place where the events happened. It would have been very, very difficult for them to steal this. And all the Jewish leaders had to do was to produce it. So the stolen body theory often falls short. Another theory people have is the twin brother or the lookalike theory. And this is actually a theory that's put forth by... Um, modern Muslim scholars, and they basically say there was, I, I, was, I call this the prestige theory. And uh, this is a theory where Jesus had a, a brother who looked like him, and he was kept in secret. But part of the problem with this theory is that Jesus' mother was present at his crucifixion, and his closest friends attested to who he, who he was after his resurrection. And understanding a mother's love, mothers know their children no matter what. It would have been very, very difficult for a mother to look away and be deceived by somebody who looked like her son. Another theory is the hallucination theory, that the disciples didn't actually see the risen Jesus, but rather they hallucinated or projected their desires for his resurrection into real life. One example, John Dominic Crossan, who's one of the leaders of the Jesus, Jesus Seminar, told Time magazine after the crucifixion, Jesus' corpse was probably laid in a shallow grave, barely covered with dirt and eaten by wild dogs. The disciples just made the story up. It was wishful thinking. But here's the problem with this theory. Now that we have real insight and study of what hallucinations are and how they work, hallucinations are private, not public experiences. 
Jesus appeared at a variety of times at a variety of locations, whereas hallucinations are generally, generally restricted to individual times and places. Certain types of people and personalities are more prone to hallucination than others, yet Jesus appeared to people in all different sets of psychological state. After 40 days, Jesus' appearance is suddenly stopped, whereas hallucinations tend to continue on over the course of a lifetime. And hallucination is a projection of a thought that normally pre-exists in the mind, except they have no plausibility structure for a resurrection. It's not what the Jews thought happened, and it's not how the Greeks believed in salvation. Another common theory is the first century worldview theory, and this is what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. And they basically said these Galilean peasants, they're out there fishing, honestly, probably sincere people, but they don't know what we know. They were subject to these views of nature where it was filled with powers and wonders and fairies, and now we know that it's just science. But part of the problem of this is that the Jewish community did not believe in a resurrection in the middle of history for one person. They believed that when the Messiah came, all people would be resurrected and the world would end. And so that part of the reason why the Jewish community rejects Jesus as the Messiah today, they just didn't believe that this is what happened. So to say that the Jewish community expected this to happen, this is a normal part of their worldview, was completely false. And the Greeks didn't believe in a bodily, physical resurrection either. For them, they thought the body was bad, the spirit was good, and any resurrection was purely spiritual. So there was no plausibility structure for either of these communities to believe that a resurrection happened. They were just kind of dumbfounded and scrambling to make sense of this unexplainable and unexpected event. And by the way, are we really that sophisticated? We have the iPhone we have facial recognition technology with which we make poop emojis and send them to one another. This is our technology. So why do we believe in the resurrection? Well, first of all, just a couple of reasons why Christians actually believe that this is a historical event that actually happened that has real implications. The first one, we believe in it because of the empty tomb. Following Jesus' death, a wealthy, well-known man named Joseph of Arimathea gathered his exp- gifted his tomb for the burial of Jesus. And if you were, and people knew who he was, they knew where Jesus was buried. And if you were going to start a legend about somebody rising from the dead, you would go far away from where it actually happened, where it could be verified, to some distant place where people were more gullible and had no experience of it, and you would start a myth. You wouldn't start by doing it right here, right now, to preach the resurrection in the same city where Jesus had been crucified. This would have been a shock. Paul Althaeus, a uh, historian, says this, they could not have been, this myth could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for even an hour, if the emptiness of the tomb had not been established as a fact for all concerned. And Jesus' tomb was never venerated as a shrine. If his body was actually there, if you could just go see his body. At the time of Jesus, there was over 50 shrines of holy men where people came to pay their respects. This never happened for Jesus because they just don't know where the body went. What's your explanation of where the body went. Christians make the claim the body wasn't there because Jesus rose from the dead and walked out of the grave. The second reason Christians believe in the resurrection of Jesus is because of the appearances of Jesus. Now look, I want to be honest with you. If you've ever read the scriptures and the resurrection accounts, honestly, they're a little embarrassing. If you've re- How many of you have read Lord of the Rings? That's, well, you've seen the movies at least. Well... <laughs> That's proper myth, isn't it? Character development, narrative arc, the right people who come through at the end. Honestly, the accounts of the resurrection are kind of embarrassing for Christians. The first people to, uh, to get the resurrection appearances are women. They hold very little value in society. They can't give full testimony in court. And one of the women's had seven demons cast out of her. So if you're going to set up somebody, hey, tell me, who saw Jesus? Yeah, you know Mary Magdalene, the, the one that had the, uh, the seven demons in there? Yeah, well, she, she saw Jesus. Great, that's fantastic. <laughs> Jesus is recognized by key people. His friends recognize him. Other disciples recognize him. To prove his resurrection, he does sort of underwhelming proofs of the resurrection. It's like, are you a ghost? And he's like, well, have you got any fish? Give me, I'll, give me some fish. 
He eats the fish and like, oh my gosh, you're back from the dead. It is the snacking on salmon that is proof of the resurrection. He appears to a variety of people and personalities in different settings. And here's my basic point. The gospel themselves are, are not the kind of story you were right if you wanted to have this triumphant victory over death. It's like this is actually just awkwardly kind of how it happened. It happened that Jesus appeared to these people that we wouldn't have necessarily picked ourselves. And Jesus appeared and proved himself in ways that weren't quite heroic for modern readers. But it appears that they just wrote this down because this is actually what happened. And so the biblical accounts themselves seem to reek of a humbling authenticity. The third reason is the transformed disciples. The disciples before the resurrection of Jesus were timid and afraid. They abandoned Jesus in the garden. And in fact, it says some of them fled naked in total fear. But after the resurrection of Jesus, they, in the same city, boldly and publicly confront the very leaders who crucified Jesus. Ten of them died as martyrs, according to church history. Now, we know in modern culture that it is very, very rare. In fact, it hardly, we, we hardly even have cases of people who maintain myth and lies at personal cost. Even our, even our most loyal groups, perhaps like the mafia, these days it's like, you're in the mafia, we, you busted, it's like, okay, I'll testify, put me in witness protection in Florida. People just roll over like that. Whenever something personally comes at them, there's a personal cost. Nobody's going to give their life for a myth. Particularly if you're a Jewish person who's absolutely bound to follow the Torah, where lying is prohibited, and it's one of the ways that you adhere to covenant loyalty. So something happened to the disciples but they were convinced that what they experienced was true. But not only that, and I think perhaps one of the most striking things is that Jesus was somehow able to convince his mother and his two brothers that he was God and get them to worship him. You can impress people from a distance, but when your mother is like, that is God, and your brother's like, he is God, and your other brother's like, praise him, what has happened in their experience? Something profound has happened where people that close to Jesus had some sort of encounter where they made, again, this embarrassing but extraordinary claim. Another, I think, reason that Christians believe in the resurrection is because of the impact that this person of Jesus has had on history. Jesus, one thing that ended up happening was that Jesus changed the day of worship for the Jewish community. Jewish followers of Jesus shifted the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And they did this, and this was like a shocking move of history to move the, 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 the central day of rest outlined in Genesis and the Scriptures to change it to Sunday. This is an extraordinary move. One of the uh, people who was charged by one of the Roman emperors to investigate the Christians and interrogate them during one of the persecutions, he says this. He's talking about examining Christians. He says, I've never been present at an examination of Christians. Consequently, I do not know the nature of the extent of the punishments usually meted out to them, nor the grounds for starting an investigation and how far it should be pressed. They also declared, and this is that the sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this, that they met regularly before dawn on a fixed day, Sunday in remembrance of Jesus' resurrection, to chant verses alternately and among themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God. Some of the early accusations against Christians is that they worshipped on Sundays. But Jesus had not just shifted the Jewish community's day of celebration, which would have been Colossal, the impact Jesus has had on art and science and government and human rights and philanthropy and medicine and technology and children's rights and education and business. It's like Jesus just won't die like other historical figures. And it's like he's alive in the world in every generation, inspiring every sphere of culture. But it's not just some of these larger figures that have been inspired. It's the personal experience as well. Billions of people today claim to have had the same sorts of experiences with the resurrected Jesus. In fact, somebody who brought you here tonight, if you're not a Christian, has probably claimed to have one of these experiences with Jesus. And honestly, for the most part, they seem kind of normal enough. <laughs> Jesus talked Paul out of his hatred, Augustine out of his immorality, C.S. Lewis out of his doubt, Mother Teresa out of her fear, Tyler Perry out of bad movies. 
He's talked the people around you. Just put that one in there. And he's met many of us. That's what's so surprising. I remember very, very clearly many of my friends becoming Christians and I just wanted nothing to do with God. And I just remember feeling somewhat terrified because it just felt like one by one these friends of mine were getting picked off by some invisible force and giving their life to Jesus. And I just remembered thinking, dear God, if, but not dear God, do not, let this, do not let this happen to me. And yet, sure enough, I could not get away from the pursuing love of God until I found myself in this encounter with the Jesus of the Bible, alive and real, saying to me, I want to use your life. I want you to serve me. And it just transformed me. It terrified my parents, destroyed my relationship with my girlfriend, and launched me into a new life. It was an unbelievable experience. So I want you to see this. Christians believe in the resurrection of Jesus because the secular explanations don't quite seem adequate for the evidence, particularly when they're put together. And all of these things together, the empty tomb, these appearances of Jesus to the least likely people, the biblical accounts, the impact of Jesus in history, and so many people having personal experiences, at least increase the percentage of the credibility of Jesus being alive somewhere in the world. And I dare to say that if you're not careful, if you keep coming to things like this and keep reading things like this, you may feel something hovering around your life too. <laughs> Much to your own surprise, you may be up here a year later <laughs> sharing your story. No pressure. <laughs> so, first of all, we've said the resurrection matters because we're all going to die and every human being has to resolve in, a, in their heart what happened. And we think the resurrection matters because it's a central claim of our faith. And we think the resurrection matters because it fits the best historic and existential evidence that we have. But I want to just close tonight by, by really answering this question. What is, what is God trying to teach us through the resurrection? In these accounts that we read in the Scriptures... What is God trying to communicate to people like you and me? Well, the first thing that I think we find from these resurrection accounts is that the resurrection is about radical welcome for the least likely people. Again, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Again, Mary Magdalene was the woman who had had seven demons inside of her. Why would Jesus make his first appearance to a demonically delivered woman with no social power and standing? Well, here's why Jesus is sending a message. The resurrection is not for strong people who have it all together. The resurrection is for the outcasts and people who feel like they're not good enough. The kingdom of God is not for good people. It's for humble people. This is what Philip Yancey says in the book, Rumors of Another World. Jesus was the first world leader to inaugurate a kingdom with a heroic role for losers. He spoke to an audience raised on stories of wealthy patriarchs, strong kings, and victorious heroes. Much to their surprise, he honored instead people who have little value in the visible world. The poor, the meek, the persecuted, and those who mourn. Social rejects, the hungry and thirsty. His stories consistently featured the wrong people as heroes. The prodigal, not the responsible son. The good Samaritan, not the good Jew. Lazarus, not the rich man. The tax collector, not the Pharisee. As Charles Spurgeon expressed it, his glory was that he laid aside his glory. And the glory of the church is when she lays aside her respectability and her dignity and counts it to be her glory to gather together the outcasts. And that's what the resurrection is about. It is a gathering in the mercy of God of the outcast to a table of grace. Amen. So if you're sitting here thinking, well, you know, I'm really interested in Jesus, but I'm not very good at being good, therefore I can't be a Christian. Let me tell you, you be, trying to be good will be the worst thing for you to encounter the grace of God. It's your goodness, not your wickedness, that is separating you from God's mercy. It's a kingdom of grace. A gathering together of the outcasts. I had the privilege of preaching at a friend of mine's uh, church in another city, large church, largest church in the city. And um, I was driving around with uh, their executive pastor, the person who runs the church. And uh, we're just sitting along, just shooting the breeze, breeze. And I was like, you know, one of the questions I always ask is like, hey, how did you become a Christian? Tell me how you heard about Jesus. You know, did you grow up in the church or 
whatever. And he says, oh, no, it's actually a crazy story. You know, I was, I was in prison uh, for selling drugs. And I had an encounter with Jesus and completely transformed my life. And as it turns out, people who sell drugs are normally pretty good at like organizing things. They have some management systems and some follow-through and some discipline or whatever. And this guy, uh, this guy ended up becoming the executive pastor of this church. And I remember just driving along, looking at him and going, that is not the answer I expected. <laughs> but I thought, isn't that just so beautiful? Yeah. That somebody who is the least likely person to be a leader of a church is now leading a church because the church is in its nature. The resurrection is about the gathering together of the outcasts. Yeah. So if you're feeling like there's no way the resurrection could be for me, I've got good news for you. You're the very person that Jesus came for. It is a, it's a reminder of God's radical welcome. Second thing it does, the resurrection of Jesus, is it restores our lives. It's about radical restoration. One of the things that I just find so tender and so compelling about the person of Jesus is what he did between his resurrection and his ascension. Jesus, there's a period in, church, in the church calendar which doesn't get talked about very much, but it's the period called Eastertide. And Eastertide is the period, this 40-day period before the ascension, where Jesus has very, very limited time and capacity to establish his kingdom on earth before he goes back to heaven and leaves the disciples to build a church that will last for thousands of years. But let me ask you the question, if you were Jesus and you just conquered sin, Satan, death and hell, and you were back from the dead, and the Romans had just crucified you, and the Greeks were despising the Jewish people, what would you do? with your power and your glory. My take, quick visit to Rome. Hey, Caesar, you're actually not, you're actually not Lord. I'm actually Lord. And I'll, any way you want to work this out, I'll work this out with you. Or he could have gone over um, back to Mars Hill and had a debate and said, you know the Logos that you've been talking about? That's actually, I, I'm the Logos. And he could have just debated them and proved them all wrong and changed Greek philosophy and thought, he could have raised up an army, he could have started an empire, he could have done all these things. That's not what Jesus did at all. You know what Jesus did? He spent 40 days finding his friends who were confused and had denied their faith and dropped out, and he restored them. The resurrection shows us God's heart for people who struggle with faith. We see that Jesus loves to restore people's futures when they deny him and go back to their sin. This is exactly what Peter did. Peter loved, Peter couldn't wrap his mind around his call. Somehow his past is going to always pull him back. And so when Jesus dies, what does Peter say? He's an influential leader. It says, Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And it says, and the other disciples went with him. So his doubt is now causing a movement of returning away from the call of Jesus as if Jesus had never happened. That's strong, strong leadership, Peter. Strong leadership for the Lord there. And what does Jesus say? Jesus goes and finds Peter and he says to him, Peter, listen to me, mate. Enough with the fish <laughs> enough of the fish mate you're a shepherd say it after me do you love me yes do you love me yes then feed my sheep mate sheep not fish <laughs> and then something beautiful happens in peter's heart because at the end of his life what does he say as a fellow shepherd with you jesus changes his heart he gives him his future back jesus can give anybody's future back he spends his time finding those who've run away from him out of confusion and doubt and opening their call back to them. Another thing Jesus does is Jesus restores hope to people. Faith can be confusing. There's events that can happen that shake us to our core. And we can just have this sense of not being able to trust anybody. There's this profound sense of lostness that's sort of floating around our hearts and our lives and we can't quite identify it, but it happens all the time, and it's actually one of the hallmarks of people in New York City. Successful people, hustling people, but inside them there's this sense. Is this all this is? David Foster Wallace addresses this. He says this, It's something that doesn't have very much to do with physical circumstances. He didn't actually know about the shutting down of the, uh, the trains from Williamsburg for months at a time, basically derailing. I'm just trying to bring you in, Brooklyn. I'm just trying to bring you in. <laughs> or any of the stuff that gets talked about on the news, it's, I will never try and bring you in again, Brooklyn. I'm kidding. It's more like a stomach-level sadness. I see it in myself and my friends in a different way. It manifests itself as a kind of lostness. The sadness that the book is about and that I was going through was a real America type of sadness. I was a white, upper-middle-class, obscenely well-educated, 
had way more career success than I could have legitimately hoped for and was sort of adrift. A lot of my friends were the same. Some of them were deeply into drugs. Others were unbelievable workaholics. Some were going to singles bars every night. You could see how it played out in 20 different ways, but it's the same thing. This sort of stomach-level sadness. And you see this so much in New York because if you move here to be successful and you're not successful, your hope's taken away. If you move here and you are successful, you're like, is this all there is? This is as good as you can hope for. One of the things I love about Jesus is he loves to restore hope to lost people. There's another scene in this account where Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with a couple who are walking away from him. And this is an incredible scene. This is actually one of the women who was at the feet of Jesus and in total despair, she's leaving Jerusalem, going to Emmaus. She's given up on Christ. And then Jesus is walking along the road, having a discussion with them about their lack of hope and their disappointment. I want you to see the strength of this revelation. Jesus in his love is walking with people who are walking away from him. And then he says to them, he gives them this Bible study, which apparently was quite good. He says, starting with Moses and all the prophets, he showed them the scriptures are actually about him and he proved he had to suffer and die. And so he puts death and resurrection in context. And then they get the narrative structure of the Gospels and it clicks back into place and it makes sense. And it says, did not our hearts burn within us? as he opened the scriptures to us, and they run back and they tell the disciples, we've seen the Lord, it's true. Jesus loves to meet people when they're walking away from him and give them a sense of hope back. And I even love this, Jesus loves to restore people who've lost their faith. Thomas, Thomas, if, Thomas is a little bit of a Debbie Downer um, in the scriptures, and I don't just mean when he doubts at the end of it, I just mean the whole way through. If you've ever done a character study of Thomas, but I, I do have legitimate compassion for Thomas. Jesus appears and Thomas isn't there. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, it was so great. Jesus was there. Well, was he eating the fish? Yeah, he's eating the fish. He was doing the fish thing. Really? Gosh. And he says, well, look, I'm just not going to, I just, I don't trust any of you guys. I want to see it myself. And then one day in his mercy, Jesus just shows up. And what does he say? He's like, I'm here. Here I am. What kindness that Jesus does this. And there's many people in this room who've wrestled profoundly with doubt and they felt like they've missed out and everybody gets it but them and then Jesus has showed up in a way that's incredibly meaningful to them and he's dealt with their doubt. I don't have time to go on in tonight, but this was my very real experience of wrestling with doubt at a profound level for months, up every night, crying out to God, walking around the Upper, upper West Side, one night having just like a straight up confrontation with the God of the universe out the front of the shops at Columbus Circle. And then Jesus just meeting me in ways so personal and so intimate, my doubts were removed. The resurrection is about radical welcome. It's about radical restoration. It's also about an invitation to eternal life. So Jesus is not just talking about spiritual resurrection, the restoration of hope, our psychological sense of well-being, our, our spiritual life. He's actually talking about giving us legitimate eternal life. Now, at this point, you may be like, you, you kind of had me, but now arguing that people are going like, to really live forever, is this really true? Well, we're probably closer to it in terms of a sense of technology. And it's certainly one of the things that everybody is working on, trying to figure out why we die and how we can extend life. In the last 100 years, the American lifespan's functionally doubled. We are living longer and longer, and everybody's working on this problem. In a book that came out in 1973, uh, a book called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, he basically wrote a book with four, four main ideas about how all human behavior was actually motivated by a profound fear of death. And many of us do have coping strategies with death, trying to find a way to live forever. For some of us, it's about leaving a legacy through achievement. Maybe you just want to get so rich, you want to make 10 mils, set up a family foundation, live off the interest, and then basically have something that runs for generations. You want to accumulate wealth. Other people do literally hope that in their lifetime, there will be a scientific breakthrough where we get to live forever. The article came out, not exactly what I'd call a flattering article, about Peter Thiel, who's wrote a wonderful book called Zero to One. And uh, one of the great um, tech entrepreneurs of our time, I guess, and just a, a little controversial that he actually, his doctor recommended a practice where he basically got blood transfusions from the blood of younger men. And so he was basically like exchanging his old man blood for young man blood, just sort of like running it through his system. If you could afford it, you'd do it, don't judge. 
Sometimes we sentimentalize death, but mostly in our culture, we ignore it or hide it, so we're never confronted with it. And again, the wrecking ball comes through. But Jesus is making a claim. Here's his claim. The reason people die is because of sin. Sin affects us as people. It separates us from God. It separates us from each other. That's why the world is so jacked up and we can't just get along. And it has fractured creation. And Jesus, because he has paid for our sin, was unable to stay dead anymore because where there's no sin, there's no death, and he just pops back up to life. And because he has paid for our sin, he now says, this resurrection life that I have, I can give this to you. Not just spiritual life, but biological life. You can live forever because I've taken away your sin. The root problem has been taken away. And so when Christians turn away from their sin, they're not just trying to feel better about the dumb stuff they've done. They're actually believing that the universe will be healed Creation will be restored and that we will be a physical part of it. Now, you might be saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen, this is what we ache for, isn't it? We're all trying to heal the world through legislation, through charity, through music that gives away a percentage of what we make at big events, at government intervention, and none of it seems to work. Jesus is making the claim that he is the Lord of heaven and earth and that first through his people, then the church, and then ultimately through all of creation, He's going to bring his kingdom. He invites you to have that life. And then lastly, here's the last claim. Jesus claims to offer us a radical relationship. It's not just that the resurrection happened 2,000 years ago and that we celebrate it today. It's that the resurrection happens to people like you and like me in a place like New York today. The resurrection happens. There's a verse in Romans 8 that makes a kind of extraordinary claim, and it says this, that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can live in you, and it can resurrect your spirit, your heart, your dreams, your future, and your body, and that that Spirit will reconnect you with God in such an intimate way that your heart cry won't be one of, oh God, where are you in fear? It will be one of Abba, Father. And you can experience intimate communion. What an extraordinary invitation. And when you've experienced that, there's nothing as good in all of life. And Jesus says this, I'm the living water. And if you drink from me, you'll never thirst again. I'm the bread of life. And if you feast on me, you'll never hunger again. And That's the testimony of probably why your friends have brought you tonight because they see in your heart maybe this stomach level sadness or maybe some kind of longing and they know, I know what can fix that. If you will encounter the living God, you'll never thirst again. Now, it doesn't mean that your life's going to be fine and dandy, but it means that those deep, core, fundamental, existential longings will be fully met. Here's, Here's a promise of Scripture. It says this, in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore so the christian life according to jesus the resurrection is so that we can experience fullness of pleasure and fullness of joy so this is why christians just every year throw the party again and again and again and that's why people dust off their suits and ladies buy new floral dresses a lot of floral tonight folks a lot of floral And why we have cake and why people go out after for drinks because they actually believe the good news that Christ is alive and we can know him and we can be born again. So standing in front of that tomb and hearing that person say, this is where some Christians believe their Messiah rose from the dead. I'm sitting there holding this cup of coffee and I just had this moment of personal witness where I was like, I'm one of those Christians. He's my Messiah. And I believe he walked out of the grave. You can experience God tonight. You can know him. You can know that you're not abandoned. You can know that this is not all there is. You can know forgiveness for your failure, your guilt, and your shame. You can know that you have eternal life. You can know that there's a purpose, a future, and a calling for you. You can experience the joy of being united with Jesus Christ. You can actually have that existential experience of the cry of Abba Father, where you receive the spirit of adoption. You can be forgiven. You can have power to be holy. You can be justified as though you've never sinned. You can be confident that you'll see those who know Christ and enjoy eternal life with them. 
and you can enjoy the wonder of resurrection life now. So the question is, what will you do with Jesus' claim to be the resurrection and the life? Please don't ignore it. If you've never really studied this, I, just, I challenge you, like, prove me wrong. Go do, get into it. But only a fool never contemplates the day of their death. We've got to figure out, is Jesus real? So I close tonight with my favorite quote of all time on the resurrection. And this is from Philip Yancey. And this is what he says. In many respects, I find an unresurrected Jesus easier to accept. Easter makes him dangerous. Because of Easter, I have to listen to his extravagant claims. And I can no longer pick and choose from his sayings. Moreover, Easter means he must be loose out there somewhere. And he's loose in New York City tonight. And if you want to know him, you can turn your heart towards him. And Christ will resurrect your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, this stubborn fact in the middle of human history that you haven't abandoned the world, but you've come into the middle of it to meet our core longings, to solve our human problems, and to open up a pathway to eternal life. Holy Spirit, I just want to pray right now in resurrection power that you will manifest and reveal the person of Jesus to those who have come here tonight. For those struggling with doubt, grant them faith. For those struggling with a sense of fear, grant them peace. For those struggling with a sense of hopelessness, Lord, just give them hope. And for those struggling with faith, I pray give them an encounter with you. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just move through every street here. Manifest the power of God. Give people a revelation that Jesus Christ is alive. The Holy Spirit, as we sing, as we worship, as we think, and as we respond, I just pray, draw people.